So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. You're the King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great.
will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, to we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace, and I can only bow down and say, in this place Abba Father You are worthy of all praise To you our lives we raise You are awesome in this place Mighty God I come to you As I come into your presence Past the gates of praise to your sanctuary till we're standing face to face I look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace and I can only bow down and say you are awesome in this place mighty Awesome in this place, Abba Father, you are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise, you are awesome in this place, mighty God, you are awesome in this place, mighty God, you are awesome in this place. 
Just worship God this morning in our own words. Let's just lift up our praises to Him this morning in our own way. In the midst of whatever His situations are going on through this morning, let's just sing praises to our God. When we worship Him, we place our eyes on Him. We take our eyes off of our situation and we put them on Him. Let's just worship our God this morning. For you are worthy, you are worthy. join the angels that are singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. We worship you this morning, Jesus. We worship you this morning. The Lamb that was slain we worship you for taking away the sins of the world, for making a way to, to heaven through you. We worship you. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. Oh, we thank you for this time of worship. This morning. We thank you for how holy you are. As we transition to our prayer time, I want us to remember a few people who are experiencing loss this week. Donna Dellinger passed away on Wednesday. And we had her funeral here on Friday. So we need to be praying for Tom, who was with his wife for so many years. They were teenagers when they got married. They were barely 20 years old. They looked really young in their wedding book. And that we need to pray for Mary Jones, who lost Andy on Friday. She's here with us this morning. Hi, Mary. We need to pray for her and her family. They're experiencing the loss of Andy, and any of you know knew Andy when he was here. So we need to lift those, those, those that are mourning the loss of their loved ones this morning. We also have names in the bowls that you can come and you can grab a name and you can pray for them. Lift up their names because these are people that need a touch from Jesus, that need an encounter with Jesus in their lives. We're also going to have other needs on the screen that you can pray for. But we're going to spend the next five minutes. Remember, prayer is an act of worship. So we're not done with worship. We're just going to worship in a different way this morning. And at the end of our prayer, we're going to pray for the sick. And trust God to bring healing to those who are battling illness and disease and, and struggles. So let's attend, spend the next five minutes praying and seeking God's face. Going after Him this morning.
is the other things you can pray for is you can pray for our national state and local leadership on our church leadership you can pray for our youth group and our kids ministries you can pray for our missionaries I want to let you know we have a missionary joining us on Wednesday you can pray for them as well but pray for Jim and Linda Scholes our missionaries to Alaska the unreached people in Henry County and and of course healing of the sick in our church and in our community keep these in prayer as we pray and we continue to seek after his face Before we pray for the sick, I want us to lift up our teachers and our school administrations and our principals and everybody who's under so much extra pressure this school year as the Delta variant, all that stuff is, is really just rearing its ugly head. Our, our, our school leadership needs prayer. So let's lift up those, those our teachers and our administrators and our principals. Lord, we lift them up to you right now, Father. Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you'll give them wisdom. Give them wisdom in the decisions that they're making, Lord God. Give them peace as they make the decisions that they need to make, Lord God. And Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you will place your hand of protection around them, Lord God, as they make decisions that, that we know will not sit right with everybody. But, Lord, help them to know that they are doing their best and that we support them in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift them up to you today, Father. We pray that you'll keep them healthy. Keep them safe from this sickness. Be with their kids. Or move in these classrooms in a special way. Or do a new thing in our school systems, we ask. Holy Spirit, we invite you just to, just to pour out your healing touch on our schools. In Jesus' name I pray. If you are here and you are sick or you represent someone who's sick, I want you to go ahead and lift up your hands across this room so we can pray for you this morning. See those hands. I see that hand, Mary. I have this list of people and we're going to pray for them this morning as well. We're going to pray for Judy, for Marlene, for Mary, who's here with us. We're praying for Mary, for Karen, and for Homer. 
Lord, we lift up all these names. We lift up all those people in this room who need a fresh touch from you this morning. Lord, we ask that you will pour out your healing power on them today, Father. Touch them by your spirit. Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, Jesus, we ask you to to just stretch out your hand and touch them today. To do the work only you can do, Father. For you are the God who heals us. So we ask for your healing power today. And we curse cancer in Jesus' name. Well, we pray, Lord God, that all cancer, Lord, that it'll be, it'll be destroyed in Jesus' name, that it won't come back. We stand with Karen and, and Tim as they're, as they're going through this, this round of chemo soon, Lord God. We stand with them. And we ask, Lord God, we cry out to you, Lord God, let nothing, let nothing stick around in her body, Lord God, that should not be there. Bring complete healing to her body today. We pray for those who have back issues, Lord God, that you will heal their backs. Touch those spines. Lord God, we pray that you will make those, str- those spines line up in Jesus' name. And we lift up all these requests to you. We thank you that you are the God who answers all our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we turn and greet each other this morning? Some faces I have not seen, and there's some faces I have not seen in a while. So let's greet each other and wave or say hi. And then after service, if you see somebody you don't know, make sure you say hi to them after service. And uh, I'm going to turn things over to Neil for a moment as he does the announcements this morning. Once again, good morning. Thank you for being here this morning. We do want to take a few minutes for some announcements. Uh, The MOPS Moms Program will be starting back up in September. It'll be the first and third Thursdays. They do, do need some workers, some child care workers. Uh, they need someone for zero to six-year-old and someone for seven to 12-year-old. So if the Lord would impress upon you to volunteer for uh, child care, see Ella after service. I'm sure she would be glad to be uh, welcome you to that. Last weekend, over in Indianapolis, there was the NASCAR race, Pennzoil 200. Next weekend, the 29th, we will be having the Henry County 500. Now, it's not a NASCAR race, it's a prayer time. The Henry County 500 is a community worship service and prayer time. It'll be August 29th at 5 p.m. in the 1400 Plaza downtown here in Newcastle. It's for all the churches here in Henry County. This year, the focus will be bringing people together to break the bonds of addiction here in this community. Now, we have made progress. A decade ago, Henry County was constantly in the top five counties in Indiana in uh, overdoses per capita. Now we are 31st. So out of 92 counties, we're still in the top one-third. The body of Christ is critical to overcoming this spiritual, emotional, and practical problem. Uh, We as brothers and sisters in Christ need to unite together to end this destruction. So the Henry County 500 next weekend will be a a time of coming together for worship and prayer and testimonies to to, uh, combat this problem. Also, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday of August. That is Family Day here at First Assembly. Children will join their parents for worship service. Give our our, uh, children's workers a little bit of a break there. We have Adult Encore is coming up October 10th through the, uh, I got that wrong. That's the end date, October 8th through the 10th uh, for adults 50 and over. Get your friends together, register. There's links on our website as well as our Facebook page. If you need assistance with all that, call in the office uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, and I'm sure that either Pastor or Carrie will help you with that. 
And also I noticed there's a 2021 VITAL conference. That's September 24th and 25th. And am I correct that that is a women's conference? So that's, that's coming up also. So again, welcome. If you're new here with us this morning, please text WELCOME, quote, WELCOME, to 765-300-3861. You'll get information about our church and open up communication with us. Now, do you remember all this? If not, you can go to our, <laughs> our website page or and look at the events and find those things. And with all that, I'll turn it back to Pastor. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. We thought we'd get somebody else up here, so you weren't just looking at me all Sunday. So we're also going to get Chuck up here to do some announcements, and I need to turn off the monitors because I am ringing up here. I probably don't hear it, but it's one of my things that bug me. So let me get my iPad really quick. Technology is great. I can control our sound booth from my iPad if my iPad works with me. So here we go. All right. If you have your Bibles with me, please turn with you today. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 15. We're going to be reading out of Acts chapter 15 today. There we go. Hopefully that's better for me. All right. Acts chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 35. So before we go there, let's pray. Let's just ask the Holy Spirit just to have his way in this service today, Lord. I thank you that you've already been here in the time of worship. I thank you that you've been here in the time of prayer. Lord, I even thank you that you've been here in the time of announcements. Lord, you are welcome in this place. I'm not here for my own agenda, Father. Lord, we're here to meet with you. Nobody's here to hear me preach. We're here to encounter you. So Lord, I ask that you will take this time as we, as we look in your scriptures, as we look into your word, to what you're saying to us today. Lord, help us to hear what you're saying. Help us to apply it to our lives. And help us to leave this place changed today. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. This is what Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 35 says. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips, the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus 
that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly came, became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened and in to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The word of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. This is in Amos, I believe. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles for returning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read on the, in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. We see a few things happening in this portion of Scripture today. We see something that actually in church history we have seen a lot of over time. We see churches and people and, and institutions try to establish rules that are extra beyond salvation. The first thing we see is that these men who I believe were well-meaning they were Pharisees who were believers who came up with these rules to say they, they must be circumcised and follow all the laws of Moses for them to be saved. And what we're seeing here is something that we can all fall back on or, or see come up in our own lives if we're not careful. We can see that we, put, we can make rules for ourselves that make a relationship with Jesus even more difficult. So far in the, in the book of Acts, we have seen new believers after new believers come into the early church. We've seen the church grow by thousands. If we saw thousands of people in Henry County come to the Lord, we would have a brand new Henry County. The, 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 the problem that we're addressing at the Henry County 500 would no longer be a problem because people will be set free by the power of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. So we've seen new believers after new believers come into the early church. We've seen Paul and Barnabas go to the Gentiles and see them come to God in huge numbers. All of a sudden we see the religious start to rear its ugly head and say, to really be saved, they must do these things. 
What I find encouraging is that even Pharisees, listen, before we, we bash those who made the rules, I'm encouraged by the fact that Pharisees are believers. They're not the bad guys. They're just, they're just misinformed. All right? They're falling back on their tradition, on what they've known all their life. How many of us understand and realize that it's hard for us to change our ways if we've been doing something for a long, long time? It's hard. Okay? I've had people try to convert me to become an IU or Purdue or Notre Dame fan. It's not going to happen because I'm very stubborn. Luckily, my way to heaven is not through Indiana or Purdue. It's, it's through Jesus, so my salvation is intact even though I'm a Cornhusker fan. And we play this next weekend, so... Pray that I don't yell too much at the TV. All right. I'm excited. Sorry. Football season is... I love college football. I'm just going to... If you don't know that already, uh, you'll know that soon. All right. But in the midst of this, we see something happen that we see happen all the time. The creation of extra rules for salvation. We see this throughout church history. Throughout church history. it's, It's not a... It's not like shame on them for doing this. No, we've, we've done other stuff like, like back when the Catholic Church was the only church, like they had all these rules where, that you had to go through, and, and Luther got upset about that. That's why he caused, that's why he threw up the 99 Thesis and, he, and, and caused there to be a split. And then the Lutheran Church, they had all these extra rules, and so that's why there was a split from them. And, and so <clears throat> we always have our extra rules in church. I want you to know that the extra rules, they should not be there because I believe that rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Now, rules are important. Don't get me wrong. I love the rules on the road. Okay? I love the fact that you're supposed to stay in your lane. Boy, I'm so grateful that for that that yellow line down the middle. And when I'm driving down Main Street, I wish people wouldn't hug that yellow line so close. I don't know if you've ever driven down that road, but Main Street, when you go south to Riley, is really wide on both sides, yet everybody wants to be right on the yellow line. I'm like, come on, people. There's, you have like 20 feet on the other side. Just, just get further away from me. But I love the fact that they're staying on their side. Otherwise, we'd have lots of accidents, right? I love the fact that, that there's these rails on the side of the road, especially when you're going over a deep, in, deep drop, steep drop-off made of metal that keep you from disobeying the rules of the lane and going overboard. If you fall asleep at the wheel, hope those guardrails are there to wake you up pretty quick. As much as those little things on the side of the road, those little indents, those little speed bump things, they go... Vrrr, as you drive over them, I, as much as it bugs me when they're right on the line, I'm happy they're there. It reminds me to stay in my lane. So rules are good at times. But when it comes to salvation, extra rules are unnecessary. Let's look at this again. Acts 15.1 Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Jesus never anywhere said you must be circumcised and obey the laws of Moses to follow me. Nowhere. Yet these men were saying this. Acts 15.5 says this, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Famous theologian Stanley Horton said this in his study on Acts. This has often been the cry of false teachers. You will lose your salvation if you do not accept our special teaching. Some still say that a person is not really or fully saved unless they go through certain prescribed rites or ceremonies. All these fail to recognize that salvation is by grace through faith alone as clearly taught in Romans 10, 9-10, and Ephesians 2, 
8 through 9. I have experienced these rules, and I was going to tell a story, and I decided against it. So I felt like God said, you're not, not, to, not to throw any place under the bus, so I'm not going to. But I remember when I was in college, I went to a, a church, and there were some weird rules there. And they cornered me, and they challenged my salvation. And I realized that it's still a lie, that if you don't follow certain rules, you're not really saved. Don't get me wrong, rules can be a good thing. If there are no rules, there would be chaos. And in fact, they did give the early church some rules to live by. In Acts 15, 20, they said, Instead, you should write to them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual morality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Why, the, why did they make these rules? The first two requests, to keep away from the pollutions or polluted things, of idolatry and from all forms of sexual immorality, or for the sake of the Jewish witness to the one true God and to the high moral standards of a, that a holy God requires. This again is from Stanley, Morton, Stanley Horton. Gentiles should not retain anything of their former idol worship, not even as family heirlooms, even though they, were, they now knew these things were meaningless and harmless. Their idolatrous neighbors would misinterpret this and suppose the worship of God could be mixed with pagan worship or pagan ideas. The Gentile believers also had to be reminded of the high moral standards that God requires. They came from a background where immorality was accepted and even encouraged in the name of religion. It took considerable teaching to make them realize that the things everyone else was doing was wrong. In several of Paul's epistles, he had to deal very sternly with the problems of immorality. So far, I believe that of those four rules, the one that we really need to practice for our own sake is sexual morality, is, is abstaining from sexual immorality, not practicing sexual morality, but keeping from sexual immorality. Sorry, it sort of sounded like I was saying to do that. No, don't do that. We need to abstain from it. Why? Because the world, we need to be separate from the world. One of the biggest things that we see everywhere is, is to have sex outside of marriage, to, do, to live an immoral lifestyle, to, to do things, and it's okay. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's, but see, here's the thing. God has high moral standards. And so we're, we'd be good to live by those standards. The second two requests, to abstain from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood, or for the sake of promoting fellowship with the Jewish believers. You see, a lot of them, they wanted to fellowship with the Gentile believers. But the Gentile believers still had a bad habit of eating meat sacrificed to idols, eating meat that, where the animal was killed by strangling, not by letting of the blood. And they would use the blood in certain areas. Well, I know we don't drink the blood of animals for the most part, and we don't, you know... We, we butcher things correctly, but for the, for the Israelites to be able to fellowship with them, they needed to know that it was at least some, they were making an attempt of, of making the food kosher. Okay, so it is for the means of fellowship. Basically, he's saying here, the rules we need to do is, is, is keep away from sexual immorality and promote fellowship among believers. But I want you to notice that it was not a stipulation that would cost them their salvation or something that was to be allowed, that something that was to be followed to be saved. It was phrased this way in the letter in verse 29. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat strangled, of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Ever since the beginning of the church, we have seen people try to add other rules for salvation. Like the early church, we must resist those extra rules strongly. And I love how it says here that you will do well to avoid these things. It was strongly encouraged. We never said, and if you don't avoid these things, you're going to hell. You're going to lose your salvation. Because God is a God who forgives, who, who helps us with our repentance. When we, when we come to Him and we say, I'm so sorry for this sin in my life that you pointed out to me. 
God is, is faithful to cleanse us from all sin. Because our salvation is not based on following the rules. But it is an invitation to enter into relationship. See, rules without relationship leads, leads to, what was the word I used? Rebellion. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. But when we follow Jesus, when we come to Him and give our lives to Him, it's an invitation to enter into a relationship. Acts 15, 7-21. It says this, After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God knows the heart, shows that He accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as He did to us. He did not discriminate between them and us, for He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Paul and Barnabas. Verse 14, Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose people for his name from the Gentiles. I want to jump down to 17. The rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who, do, who does these things, things known from long ago. I love this interaction. There's so much encouragement in here. Basically, what I take away from this is, if God didn't require it, neither should we. If God didn't require it, neither should we. Jesus sacrificed everything, His whole life, to make it easier for us to get to heaven. It isn't our job to make it harder. <coughs> and that's what we see in the early church. That's what we see happening here. Is they made it more difficult. Imagine going up to a grown man who wasn't circumcised and saying to follow Jesus, you must become circumcised. I don't know if it was me. I may have said, all right, count the cost, it's not worth it. That's too much to ask. That's why it's important for us not to add extra requirements to get to heaven. What did Jesus require of us to find salvation? We see this in Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Jesus already made it hard enough. He says, die to yourself, deny yourself, change who you are, become a new creation, Take up your cross and follow me. What did the cross represent? It represented dying. It represented death. It represented, it represented an agonizing, painful, torturous end. But he said, you must take up your cross and follow me. If you follow me, you will find life. It's already hard enough. John three sixteen and 17, we all know this verse. Sometimes we don't think about it very much. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. All we need to do is believe in Him. But we have to die to who we were. We need to die to who we were. And so that's the first thing that God requires of us is for us to die to our old selves. Which takes a daily practice. There's a lot of my old habits that try, keep trying to come back. I've been saved almost all my life. I remember when I was a teenager and I walked away from God for a period of time. I picked up some really bad habits. And sometimes, well those really, really bad habits are gone. Some of those things I thought were okay, that weren't okay, still try to rear their ugly head. 
But see, I keep denying myself. I keep dying to, to who I was. I keep surrendering myself to God. Say, God, take this away from me. I think until the day we die, we're never going to be done repenting for our sins. We need to live a lifestyle of repentance. But that's between you and Jesus. See, when you, when you enter into, into Christianity, you begin a relationship with Jesus. And you allow Him to look into your heart and show you some things that need to die so that you can actually have real life. I remember we had a barn in Evansville behind our house that was overtaken by vines. Every year we cut back those vines. And we, one year we thought, we did it. They're clear, they're gone forever, and guess what? The next year they showed up again. Even though we thought we got to the root of issue, there was a little root that stuck around. At our house now, there's a, there's a few plants that I thought, man, I, I worked really hard at the beginning of the spring to get rid of them because they're really ugly and they're, they're not a weed, but I guess Ellie said anything you don't want there is a weed, so I guess it is a weed. And so I remember digging down into it and pulling it out by the roots, and I thought I got everything. I had a big hole and found dirt to fill it up again, and we planted stuff there. Last week I was mowing, and look, what started shooting up? Some of that plant again. I'm like, no! I thought I got rid of it. Same as like sin in our lives. So here's the deal. God's not there to beat us over the head and say, you didn't follow this rule exactly. You're not, you're not right with me. No, he's like, all right, let me... Let's do some gardening, son. Let's dig it out. Let's take care of this. So that those plants that I wanted to plant there that are fruitful can grow and they can multiply. You see, when we accept Jesus into our lives, we're walking into a relationship or a partnership with Jesus that He can show us the things in our lives and He can get rid of them out of our lives. But we need to learn to take up our cross daily and follow Him. Examine our hearts daily. Look for those sinful issues daily. And rejoice when He shows us these things. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for showing me that before it got out, of, got out of control. Before that vine took over my barn again. And so while there are some things we should do, they still aren't a requirement for salvation like we saw earlier. Those rules, while there are things that we shouldn't do, they weren't a requirement for salvation. The only requirement is to follow Jesus. And granted, it's not an easy path, but it's easier than the way it was. Not only that, it's a path that brings freedom. It says this in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only Oh, a few find it. While being a Christian isn't easy, we don't need to make it more difficult with our own hurdles that we like to put down for others. Instead, we need to encourage others as they walk down this path. We need to show other people. We need to point them in the right direction and help them find this narrow path and then walk it with them as long as God allows us to walk it with them. See, I believe... I remember a long time ago I was praying and I remember, you know, we've all met a lot of people in our life, I'm assuming. Some people you probably haven't talked to in a long time. But see, our, our paths converged at one point and then they, they may, and it's not like they went off the wrong path, it's just life took them in a different direction. So for as long as you walk with people, you need to help encourage them down the path of righteousness. They're responsible for their own path. You're responsible for your own path. You're responsible for following the voice of Jesus and going the direction He leads you to go. But see, as long as we're with other people, we need to, make, we need to be encouraging and not place down hurdles for them to jump over. And like we looked at earlier, there are rules that we do need to follow. And the church put four rules down that we already looked at. But we need to re remember that rules apart from relationship, sorry, rules that come out of relationship can be a good thing. Guess what? I have rules for my marriage that are put there to help me have a good relationship. They're not there 
be, they're not like a burden, like, oh, I can't see how that guy looks. Oh. Oh, I have to do the dishes after she cooks the food. Oh. No, I do it because I want a good relationship with my wife. I have these rules set up that are come out of my relationship with her. Out of my, out of my enjoying being with her. When we enjoy being with Jesus, we're going to put up rules for ourselves to help us with our relationship with Jesus. See, rules aren't a bad thing, but when they're, they're a good thing when they come out of the relationship. Rules, relationship with rules leads to freedom, but rules without relationship lead to rebellion. And so we need to give ourselves rules. We need to give ourselves uh, th- ways to do, but it needs to come out of relationship. Peter said this in verse 8 and 11, God knows the heart. He showed that He accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as He did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors, ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. See, David was a man after God's own heart. I just thought of David here. He followed the rules as much as he could, but he had such a good relationship with God that it didn't feel like a burden. Remember when it says in the Scriptures that he danced basically naked down the street because he was so excited that the ark was coming home. He had all these sacrifices, animals to sacrifice. He did all this stuff, and it didn't feel like a burden to him because he was excited that his God, that the, that the place that represented the home of his God was coming home. You see, when you have a relationship with God, the rules, the things, the extra things don't feel like a burden because it brings you closer to God. When you don't have a relationship, the rules can seem overwhelming. You see, one thing that leads people, that causes people to not want to follow Jesus at times is when we put down all the rules before we make sure they have a relationship. See, discipleship is helping people learn how to live differently. You shouldn't expect people to be 100% different the next day after they get saved. Now, God should do something new in their heart, and there should be something immediate that you can tell, that they can tell. But, it's not our, but see, it's our job to come alongside people and disciple them and help them learn how to pray, help them learn how to read the Word, help them learn how to hear from God and follow the, the instructions that He has for them. Because when there's a relationship that leads to rules, they find freedom. Because rules without relationship leads to rebellion, but relationship with rules leads to real change. God wants to change us. It always makes me mad when I hear people say, humanity can't change, people can't change. I say, that's a falsehood from the devil. Because I'm changed. I'm not the person I once was. I thank God I'm not the person I once was. I'm not even the same person I was two years ago when I got here as your pastor. God's changed me since then. And guess what? He's going to change me down the road. He's making me more into His image. It says in Matthew 8, 2-5. through I love this verse. It says, He called the little child to Him and placed the child among them. And He said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. He wants us to change. He doesn't want us, he doesn't want us to change into becoming more pious, perfect people. But to be more trusting like children. You know, you can tell when someone has been impacted by God and when they just follow His leading just willingly, they don't even think about it. It's like a little child says, hey, son, 
we're going to go, or hey, daughter, we're going to go, um, hey, trust me as I throw you up in the air. Okay. As an adult, you're like, oh, I don't know. If you miss me, I might break seven things. I don't know if I, you're not strong enough for that. But see, we need to have faith like a little child. John 14, 6 through 7 says this Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. When we learn to spend time with him, we learn to know him in a deep way. It's through relationship that we know God. To be born again means to be born of the Spirit. This is what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3. See, we must become born again. We must become a new creation, a new person. It says this, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Why is it? That we have a history of turning to rituals and tradition for forgiveness. I believe it's because we have a problem giving up control. I think the extra rules are our way of control. We don't want to just trust God. We want to, we want to feel like we have control in our own change. And so we make rules. We make regulations. We, make, we, we, we end up coming up with our own rituals. Only God can forgive sin. It is through relationship with Jesus that we get victory and a new start, that we become born again, that we become like a child, that we get to know Him. Do you feel like you need to do a lot of stuff to get closer to Jesus? Today, do you feel like in your life you have a lot of rules and it feels heavy, it feels like a burden to know Jesus more and more? Rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being... You feel very free, 10 feeling like you feel very burdened by the rules that you have for yourself. Maybe you think, if only I can, man, if I, this is too hard to get close to God. I I know, I know I need to pray seven hours a day. And then three more in tongues, and, and and I need to read the Bible from front to back three times a year, and I gotta, listen, all this stuff is good. But if you're putting a burden on yourself, you're putting st- hurdles to jump over, to get closer to God, it's not God. Do you feel like you need to do a lot of stuff to get closer to Jesus today? On a scale of 1 to 10, in your own thoughts, where are you? I don't want you telling me. It's between you and God. Jesus wants us to come close to Him, to know Him. He wants us to to walk, to walk into a relationship with Him that's, that's, that's free of burdens, that's free of hurdles, that's free of hardships and, and beating yourself up for, for failing. And I think of the, the prodigal son who he messed up and he was living in sin and filth and he said, if only I go back to my dad, he, he feeds his servants better than I eat and I can just become his servant. And as the father sees him way down the road and what happens? He sprints to his son and he gives him a hug and a kiss in the middle of his filth. You see, God's not asking you to do a bunch of stuff to come back to him or to come close to him. He's just asking you to come to him. That's why Peter and Paul and Barnabas so passionately stood up against these rules. They were passionate because they knew that God wanted these Gentiles to be free and He saw the yoke of burnt, of uh, the, the heavy yoke that was, they were trying to put on these Gentiles. Jesus said to Himself, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. If it's a heavy yoke, if it's a heavy burden, it's not from God. Or you're carrying it wrong. Maybe you're trying to carry this yoke and this burden all by yourself. You're not inviting Jesus into the process. He wants to come alongside you and be the big, the big bull that takes all the weight while you're the little baby calf walking next to him. Look what I'm doing, Daddy. That's great, son. 
I'm doing all the work. I'll let you get what you think you're making progress. Sorry, that's just how I see God in my mind. Jesus wants us to come close to him, to know him. Matthew 19, 13 through 15. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little, little children come to me and don't hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, they, he went on from there. Jesus wants us to come to him like little children. be honest with you, we've, we, live, we serve an upside-down kingdom. The closer you are to Jesus, the more childlike you should be. The closer you are to Jesus, the more childlike you should be. Whew, that was good. That hit me in my heart. Thank you, Jesus. When we come to him in worship, we should be able to just sit there and adore him. We come to him in prayer. <laughs> He's not going to get mad at us for talking to him about all the things that really don't matter. He just wants to hear our voice. But then he wants us to be quiet and hear his voice. Remember when my boys were little, they... They loved little Einstein, and they wanted to talk about it, and I don't care. I just love hearing their voice. Now I know that song to this day. I'm not going to sing it for you. See, God, he wants us to become like little children. So little children don't know all the rules. That's why I'm excited. That's why I love kids' church and youth ministry, man. We would play dodgeball in the sanctuary when I was a youth pastor. They didn't know the rules. They didn't know they weren't supposed to throw things and run and make messes in the sanctuary. But man, when they worshiped, they just worshiped hard. They prayed hard. That's why I love kids' ministry, because they don't know all the rules. We need to become more like children. We need to forget the rules. We need to draw closer to Jesus. So where are you on that? Scale one to ten. One being completely childlike. And ten being not even close. You don't need to tell me today. But if you've been struggling with any of what we've been talking about today. If God has stirred your heart this morning. Now is the time to respond. Let's come to the altar. The altars are going to be open in about 10 seconds. And if we need to say, God, I have put on so many rules and I have not felt like my faith has been childlike. I, listen, there's no judging here. I need to be at the altar. Because I'm not even close, as close to being childlike as I once was. I used to dance like David danced at worship. And I need to get back to that again. I feel closer to God than I was then, but I need to be more childlike in my faith. I'll be honest with you, there's times I pray for people and I feel doubt in my heart because I feel like maybe I'm not good enough. And I put up all these walls, I put up all these boundaries for myself. And we need to repent of those things and become childlike again. So if God is speaking to you this morning, we need to respond. We need to become childlike in our faith. We need to not be ashamed of running up to our Papa, to our Daddy God, and giving Him a hug, of jumping in His lap,
So if God has dealt with you this morning with any of this, I want to invite you to go ahead and get up and start coming to the altar. I'm already here. Kay's going to play. Let's come to the altar and lay down anything that may be hindering you from having a real relationship with Jesus. Not one driven by rules, but one driven by intimacy. Thank you for this call that you have on our lives. To not be one full of rules without relationship, but to have a relationship with rules that lead to freedom and real change. Thank you that the only rule you've given us is to follow you. To follow you be like you, to be like little children. Help us be more like you, Jesus, that did what we only saw the Father do. Help us do what only we see you do, to be childlike in our faith. Thank you for the freedom comes in you. Thank you for not showing any discrimination. For pouring out your spirit on all of us. 
If you don't know Jesus today, if you don't know Jesus today, I want you to know that it's not hard to start a relationship with Him. All you got to do is say, is just confess your sins to Him. Say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Maybe even tell Him the sins that you've done. Say, Lord, I've done this, I've done that. I'm a sinner. I'm separated from You. I need You in my life. I believe in You. I trust in You. I will follow You. Help me to follow You. Come into my life and take over. Something along those lines is all you need to say to start your relationship with Jesus. The next thing I want you to do, if you've never done, even if you've been a Christian for a while and you've never done this before, find someone who you can walk this path with that can encourage you in those hard days who can pray with you and love on you. We all need discipleship. Holy Spirit, help us today. Help us become more childlike. Help us to have a deeper and a better relationship with you. We don't, where we don't trust in our own thoughts, we trust in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless you today with the promises of God, which are yea and amen. The Holy Spirit will make you healthy and strong in your bodies, minds, and spirits. Let's move in faith and expectancy. I pray that God's angels will be with you, protect you, and keep you. Be blessed with supernatural strength to turn your eyes from foolish, worthless, and evil things. Instead, you will behold the beauty of things that God has planned for you as you obey His will. God will give you success and prosperity in your businesses and places of labor as you acknowledge and obey the imperative of Scripture concerning the tithe. God will give you spiritual strength to overcome the evil one and avoid temptation. God's grace will be upon you to fulfill your dreams and visions. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your long life. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord will lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you today in the name of Jesus. I want to invite you out on Wednesday night. We have a missionary joining us that night. A missionary to the Philippines. You do not want to miss it. I'm excited to have him share what God's doing in his life and in his family's life in the Philippines. We love you guys. Have a wonderful week.